and I want to welcome you to our first safety, school safety and security summit. Our first, because we hope there, this is going to be the first of many interactions with our community around Colonial's efforts to keep our staff, students, and our buildings safe and secure during and after school during all of our events. This uh, evening we have a, a, a distinguished panel here for us uh, to, to facilitate the conversation. We have our districts. Sorry. We have with us our district safety and security specialist, Mr. John Barr, who's going. I'm going to turn it over to in a minute, and then we're going to hear from our lead constable, Mr. Carl Bond, and then we have with us this evening special presentations from the PIOs from Newcastle County Police and the Delaware State Police, Officer. India Sturgis and Officer Duffy from County Police. And then we close out with a uh, conversation with a former parent, local legend, I guess, is what he likes to consider himself. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm poking fun at Mr. Burton, but uh, Mr. Frank Burton, who had, has had children come through the Colonial School District, former FBI uh, aid special agent, and is here to talk to us around uh, family and parent support around school safety, and then he's gonna facilitate the Q&A um, with, the, with the audience and, and folks in the room. And throughout the room are several district folks who are involved in school safety and security. So we hope the Q&A can be robust. Uh, and also, if you have any questions following, uh, the various folks here in the room will be able to help respond. I hope that this is an informative evening. Uh, we know it's being a live stream or broadcast, however you might uh, want to watch it. Hopefully there, there's folks paying attention out there as well because this is a very important topic and a very difficult time for uh, public ed education as well as society in general around uh, violence and danger uh, to those uh, who are just going about their day doing what they know to do best, which is teach students, students to learn, administrators to support schools, drivers drive buses, folks feed uh, students. So uh, that said, I'm going to turn it over to John Barr, our safety and security specialist. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody for taking their time to come out for the safety summit. Uh, first and foremost, the, for the first responders that showed up tonight, thank you for everything that you do. We do have uh, the chief uh, from Goodwill, uh, Chief uh, Majeski. Um, again, we just had a chat, and just from the response that he services with our local schools, um, we do appreciate your service. So. Part of the safety summit uh, that we felt that was important for everybody to, to understand and know and kind of share what we've been doing in Colonial for the last three years and and where we plan on going throughout the summer and some of our plans that involve around safety and security. Um, so we do a lot of procedures, a lot of planning. A lot of these plans are dictated through DEMA, um, emergency management and homeland security, some of the guidelines that are coming through safe schools. And then we take those guidelines and procedures and we pass them through to our administrators through all of our schools. And then we practice these. And how do we practice these? It's through our drills. Our fire drills are conducted every month. It's, of course, that nothing has changed there. Um, and what you will see for those that have been out of school for the last 15, 20 years, what we concentrate on a lot now, and it's sad to say, but it's some of their lockdown drills. Emergency plans around lockdowns, the threat of an active threat within the school, and we do that through tabletop exercises, and we do those tabletop tops uh, with our administrators, with our safety teams, within our schools, once a year. And sometimes the tabletop discussions are done multiple times a year, depending on the drill that we're getting ready to conduct throughout the school. The lockdown drills that we practice, is some of you may have kids that came home and said, Mom, Dad, I just got went to a lockdown drill, and they shared that experience. Yes, uh, we try to lessen that anxiety with the students by practicing these drills and we start from elementary all the way through the high school and these drills we practice not only with the students but we also practice the drills with our staff uh, we try to go through uh, alice training with all of our staff and, and i'll talk about that a little bit and that helps prepare in the event of an active threat in our in our school and what we need to do as a staff as a safety team and administrators to prepare for that event what I'm about to show you is, is the ALICE training that we went through uh, over the last three years, four years, that we've been conducting with our new hires as a refresher training with our staff, with our admin team, 
this video was taken uh, at Wilmer Elementary as we walk through the hours training portion with that school. So if you would pay attention to the screen there. This is only a Nerf gun, but this toy is training teachers at Wilbur how to react if it was the real thing. God forbid it ever takes place within the Colonial School District, but we want to make sure that our staff and our students are prepared for any type of emergency. John Barr heads up security for Colonial, his position itself a sign of the times. That's why Barr is making certain all teachers, staff, and administrators in the district get this life-saving, hands-on training called ALICE. All stands for alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evade. It is the concepts that have been you know, taught probably over the last three or four years, um, and it's, it's gaining momentum. Immediately I felt frightened um, what to do. Um, you're, you're, your mind is racing a mile a minute, and you're just trying to, how can I protect my students if this ever happened in a real situation? We empower them to make decisions based off the scenario or situation that they find yourself in, to one, either barricade the door and, and, and go through the barricading process to where we don't want the shooter to gain access to a room. Through the use of, you know, anchoring off a door, using other techniques. Um, and then worst case is that we, have, we teach them how to counter and distract a shooter to buy time for first responders to, to get to neutralize the threat. For these teachers, that meant barricading the doors in just seconds. During the training sessions, they threw Nerf balls as a distraction. But if an active shooter enters any school in Colonial, teachers learn they should not passively hide like they were trained to do in the past. Instead, they should be prepared to throw any and all objects at the person who comes in with an intent to hurt or kill. It was a little emotional because you got to put yourself in a situation and think, what would you do if this was really happening? So I try to do that within the drills and the number one goal is to protect the children. As a male, I feel like I have to be the first person, the first responder. I, it's, it's built into me, and I think most men feel that way. We're the protectors. I feel way more prepared. I feel like everybody should do this training. I think it's awesome. Everybody, everywhere. It's very helpful. That I, I'll take whatever I have in my hand, and I'll protect my babies. Thinking ahead and always being prepared is what happens every day here in Colonial Nation in the best and worst of situations. That's it for this edition of Keeping Up With Colonial. I'm Lauren Wilson, your public information officer for the Colonial School District. So as you see, that is a great video to be transparent on how we prepare ourselves as a district, as an admin team as our safety teams. We continue to do that with our new hires as they come on board. Our goal is to make sure that they're prepared once they get to the building before the start of the school year. We never know when an event will take place. However, we wanna to try to lessen the, the catastrophic failure or the, or the injuries and be prepared as much as we can. And doing these trainings like this, yes, as you heard one of the staff members saying, it is stressful. Um, but we have to go through this training. And so if your student comes home Try to talk them through this. Um, talk, why, why do you do those drills at school? Uh, we hope that never, you know, we never have to go through that in, in real life, um, but we are prepared. So some of the other things that we have done over the last three years, um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but our procedures in, are, are statewide. They're not, it's, it's through Navigate 360. It's a platform that's monitored, not only by myself, our lead constable, our district admins, but it's also overchecked by DEMA uh, with the school or comprehensive school safety program. And those procedures are, are just checked and followed. So our administrators, they go through our plans, they update our plans, and they edit the plans as necessary based on the, any new procedures that may come out. We do have some safeguard procedures that's in place. Um, if you have a student that comes home, um, we, I work uh, with John Cooper and Sherry Woodall and some of our interventionists with our mental health team. And we put in place some of the safeguard applications like GoGuardian. And GoGuardian is an application that monitors our students' Chromebooks. Uh, it's got algorithms it's, it's set in place. So if a student looks up how to kill, how to commit any kind of harm to their self, 
anything like that, it will flag it and will notify some of the key players within the district so we can get on our systems, we can make notifications to the admins or counselors and try to get ahead of it and intervene. We also have get notifications from Take Care Delaware and that kind of gives us an, an insight. Uh, if a student or a family member has went through a crisis situation, just say over the weekend, outside of school, after hours, that we actually get notified of that person's name uh, of, from the student, so we can then, then offer some assistance in the morning when they do come in. It kind of gives us some, a little bit of uh, insight that something has happened to cause them to hit the, uh, the system. And then we have the Stop It app. So the Stop It app right now, we've been running for like three years, I think going on three years. The Stop It app is an anonymous reporting system for students. It's loaded on their Chromebooks, it's shared. Parents can use that, the students can use it. And that reporting system goes straight to us. It goes to myself, our lead constables, and some other key players that's in the district. It's an instant notification. If they are still on their Chromebook, we can message that student and to gain more information. Sometimes we get it through photos, sometimes we get it through uh, messages, pictures, and we've been able to intervene through this stop it application to uh, stop fights and some other things that they've uh, alerted us on. So those applications we've been running within the district throughout two or three years now. So and it helps with us intervene with the intervention process uh, of getting to these students and providing them some assistance. So over the last three or four years, um, again, we got 14 buildings, 16 facilities, give or take. Um, the communication process, just say in, in this building here, radios, repeaters, a lot of that communication process has all been upgraded and that's to help our safety team and our administrators, our teachers and our staff stay in communication during an emergency. And then also it helps out during the day-to-day -day, uh, activities that take place in any school. But those have been upgraded, they continue to get upgraded. It's typically every year that we're trying to improve upon these communications. Cameras, have, if you looked around, uh, coming into any of our facilities across William Penn, exterior, interior, uh, for William Penn it's 100%, our middle schools is 100%, 360 around the schools, in schools, our middle or our elementary schools, common areas. We are increasing our camera footage in schools, uh, the exterior of our schools, to help process uh, efficiently, get key facts, and just help process uh, you know, it could be outside criminal behavior that takes place on the weekend, and we've had that. But it helps us process, it helps our administrators get to the facts and then get back to their normal activities. Um, so that's always a, an add-on. Uh, access control, and that's the badges that we use, all of our staff members. Right now we are continually uh, upgrading our access control in our common areas. Some of our middle, middle schools, our elementary schools, now William Penn, has access control even in their cafeterias. So the doors always are locked. Staff has access control to open those doors to let students in during that time. If an event takes place, those doors are already locked. We don't need to go chase down keys. We don't need things like that. And so we are working throughout the district where we continue to work through the district this summer and upgrading and trying to get to the rest of our facilities. Because that is important. During an active shooter, a lockdown, any lockdown procedure, having locked doors and being having access to lock them is key. And by having access control, that allows us to do that. So we got to go down into the HALO system. So the HALO system, for those that are not aware of it, HALO systems are in our bathrooms. And we initially, a few years ago, I worked with John Cooper and his team. From that side, it started off as, uh, what can we do to identify students that are vaping, smoking? Um, and so we reached out we had a couple uh, different vendors, and then we came up with Halo. Now, a Halo system is, in, is like a fire detector, but it's in the bathroom, and it detects about six different things that we utilize it for. Smoke, vape, THC, uh, word help, aggression in a bathroom, and the worst thing we want to hear is a gunshot, but it will let us know. That alerting process is in our middle schools and our high schools currently, in all of our boys' and girls' bathrooms. Um, it's notif notifications come through our phones, through administrators and, their, and the folks that they have deemed on the dashboard to get notified. And it has been successful. Um, we have identified you know, those, some of those students and that's why those systems were put into place. 
Uh, worst case we want is to have a student go in a bathroom and do something and actually pass out the bathroom. And then we find them later. Now with having the systems in the bathroom, somebody's going to the bathroom, at least check it out to see if somebody's still in there. And so that was the whole key, one of the, the key processes for that uh, add-ons and upgrades for the, for the school. All right, so the next person I want to introduce is uh, our lead constable, Carl Bond, and he's going to just walk through the process of uh, our SRO and our constables throughout the district and some of their responsibilities. For those who don't know me, I'm Carl Bond. I'm the lead constable for the district. Um, our primary job is basically to protect the students and the staff from threats from outside and inside. Uh, we, are, we are not uh, disciplinarians. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm the lead constable, like, as I've stated before. Our primary job is to protect the students and the staff from threats from the outside and threats from the inside. Right now, currently, we have nine constables, including myself. We have three assigned to the William Penn campus. I'm assigned to Gunning Bedford. We have one at George Reed and one at McCullough. We have one at Newcastle Elementary School and one at Pleasantville Elementary School. We will assist the staff on any special things that they need, like as far as the drills. We, is, we will put, uh, assist with the drills. We will... <coughs> facilitate any other safety activity that, that, that occurs in the school. We, uh, we're not the boogeyman, we're not the person that's going to lock your child up. Uh, by law, we are still law enforcement officers. We cannot arrest anyone, but we can detain. So basically, uh, and our, our job kind of has evolved for different principals at different schools, the way they want to use us. But we, uh, basically, we want to stay away from being disciplinarians. We are not disciplinarians. We know the school's code of conduct, and we will help the principals enforce that code of conduct, but we do not have any uh, disciplinary powers. We don't, we don't suspend kids. We don't do anything like that. Uh, we may take a child out of a, or a student out of a classroom that needs to be escorted to detention or something like that, if, that's called, if we're called upon to do that. But that's basically, like I said, our, our primary purpose is to protect students and staff from threats from the outside. Uh, if there is an active shooter, we're the ones who are going to be running towards it. Everyone else is going to be running away. We're going to be running towards it. For the most part, most of us, uh, myself, I've had 31 years of law enforcement experience. Those are sitting over there. Everyone else probably has at least 20. So we've experienced everything uh, that, that can be experienced. As a matter of fact, I want to introduce you to all of them standing over there. We have Zoe McFadden, who's at William Penn. Andre Brown, who's also at William Penn. Christian Stan, who's at uh, N3, which is part of William Penn. We have Wes Reynolds, who's at McCullough Middle School. We have Jamie Rogers, who's at George Reed Middle School. And we have Kurt Philcombe, who's at Pleasantville Elementary School. And the only one that's missing is Lisa Tempe. She's at uh, Newcastle Elementary School. said to himself. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, uh, the constable program actually is, uh, is pretty much spread all throughout the state. Um, I want to say Colonial was probably one of the first school districts to, to go with uh, constables. I was hired in 2018, right after I retired from Delaware State Police. Um, right now, there are close to 390 constables throughout the state. And I think every school district in the, in the state of Delaware right now has constables, um, along with SROs. The difference between us and SROs, SROs are sworn police officers from a local or state police agency. Uh, Shannon King, who is not here, he's our uh, SRO that's assigned for Colonial School District. So that's the major difference with us. And we are, even though we're law enforcement officials certified through the state, we are employed by the school district. So we are school district employees. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to 
Andrew Sturgis and Tracy Duffy. Can you hear me back there? <laughs> okay. My name is India Sturgis. I'm Director of Public Information for Delaware State Police. Um, and uh, Sergeant Tracy Duffy and I are here to basically talk to you a little bit about what we do as public information officers and uh, how that's important to you. So I can start the video. Now at 10, brand new video of a school on lockdown. Officers forcing their way into classrooms at Jefferson High School. <laughs> Meanwhile, outside, total chaos. Police trying to control parents who swarm to the school, worried about their children. Today, the SAISD campus was on lockdown after reports of a shooting. But let's be clear, there was no shooting. However, emotions were high. Ken's Five reporter Henry Damos is live outside Jefferson tonight. And Henry, you got a hold of a new letter from school officials. What are you learning tonight? Well, EC's in this letter moving forward. School officials say that they're going to review how they notify parents. Officials say they're going to learn from what happened here just hours ago and then share that with families too. They call today discomforting. I also learned that nearly 90 officers with SAPD and the school district showed up. Here's more of what went down. So you got the same thing like we're talking about all that. Frantic parents at Jefferson High School were greeted by officers. Calm before the storm. It turned into tense moments between parents and police. Family showed up worried sick. At one point, a window was in and was on the ground. On Tuesday, SAISD says a call came in that a shooting happened inside a classroom. Out of nowhere, we just hear like lockdown, lockdown. Like. As police investigated, they realized hey, there was no shooting, no shooting. Officials also say misinformation caused parents to rush to the school. Inside, officers were sweeping the rooms, making sure students and staff were safe. 14-year-old Nehemiah Fernandez was inside. Got to like the side of the classroom, by the wall. We all sat down. 30 minutes goes by. We see two cops come in the door, like with big, heavy guns. It was, it was crazy. The freshman texting his mom, Amanda Laura, to let her know he was safe. Oh, I do understand um, parents panicking, scared, nervous, especially after what happened with the Uvalde shooting. Laura was not one of the parents that showed up to the school. She does think that nearly 90 officers who were there for being here doing what um, doing what they could and not taking it lightly because nowadays you know things like that we can't take lightly very true so what brought up such a large police response here's what we know again to recap someone called SAPD's non emergency number to say there was a shooting inside the school but again to be clear that did not happen there were also reports that there was a fight between students but school officials say tonight that staff has not been able to confirm that. They also went on to add that counselors will be here at the school tomorrow for any students and staff who need it. We're live in the West Side tonight. Henry Ramos, Kins 5. Easy's. Thank you, Henry. Okay, so uh, the reason why we showed you that video is because we want you to see how important communication is. So what we do as public information officers is we, uh, for, for, the, for the police side of things, is we communicate with the public information officers on the school side of things. We collaborate our messaging so that way it can be conveyed to you all in a timely manner and that it's accurate. Um, so when we, there are times when we'll have to respond to the school. And if we have to respond to the school for a critical incident, uh, our main job is to kind of like make sure that we have a staging area for the media. We're obtaining information from the investigators on scene as quickly as we can. So sometimes if you're following us on social media accounts and you're not getting information as quickly as you want to, it's not because we're not we're trying to hide the information from you. It's because we're literally trying to get the information and we're trying to make sure that it's accurate. We never want to put out information that's not factual. Um, um, like I said, we try to get the information disseminated to the public. 
public um, that, that to include parents and that also includes the media because they're a greater um, outlet for us to be able to push the information out quicker. Uh, we, Delaware State Police, I can tell you, uses a lot of times Twitter. So if you follow the Delaware State Police on Twitter, a lot of times when things are active, ongoing, uh, we'll tweet like every 20 to 30 minutes or if we can get it sooner, five to 10 minutes, whenever we have updated information, we try to provide that um, and, and let you know those things. We, like I said, we also coordinate that with the, the PIO from the schools uh, side of things too, so that way they're aware and can relay those, that information to you as well through their platforms, however they choose to, to reach out to you all. Uh, the next thing is, so if we, like I said, if we show up on the scene, there will be always um, like a, uh, an area for reunification for for the children. So it's important for you not to show up right at the school. Listen to the messaging from your school district. They will provide you with a location of where to show up. It's not gonna be publicly available. Guess why? Because if there is a threat out there, we don't want that person to know where your, where your children's gonna be, right? So that's why it's important, for really important for you to really listen to the messaging from, from your school district. Um, and also know that when you do show up to a, a reunification site, we're going to ask you for your ID because we don't want to make we want to make sure that we're providing uh, we're giving the child to the correct parent and their safety is is our top priority. Um, so we talked about uh, the public announcement. Um, again, police messaging can be limited. I think that I kind of explained that uh, to you. Sometimes. It's a matter of we haven't received the information yet. It's not a matter that we're hiding it. We're trying to get it out to you as timely as, it, as we can. But there are also times when we just can't put the information out because it could very well hinder the investigation. We could be tracking that suspect in a way that we can't let you know how because then if we put that information out, then they might be following us on Twitter to see that information too. So sometimes when you're not seeing information, it's not that we're not doing anything. We're actually hot on it. We just can't give every single detail of our investigation. Um, juvenile names and uh, other identifying information. So a lot of people wonder why when we do news releases, why we're not providing the juveniles names or photos or anything like that. If they're underage, it's actually against state law for us to do that. So in case anybody wonders why we don't do that, I've, I've seen a lot of things on social media where pe parents wonder why we're not putting um, uh, the juveniles' names out there in which we arrest when we find out later on that they've done a threat. There's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last thing I want to talk about is, um, you know, we don't think it's just a coincidence that most of, <laughs> a lot of the threats that we get are either um, we're getting ready to start a weekend or it's at the end of the weekend, right? So um, just be mindful of, I'm not saying that this is the situation every single time, just be mindful of, of your children, what they're doing on their social media sites, because we take every threat serious. Whether it's a hoax or not, we have to. We have to. It takes a lot of time and resources for us to come out here and make sure, and ensure the safety of the staff and the students. So if you have uh, children on social media platforms and you can monitor them, that would help us out greatly because there are a lot of times when, when things that you just saw, it's a hoax. And, and we saw all those officers there and they, for no reason. So uh, that's all I have for you today. The one thing that I, I, you know, you take from me is just really please listen to the messaging from your school district. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Sergeant Tracy Duffy with Newcastle County Division of Police. And while we work very closely with our partners with, of Delaware State Police, but also the constables and um, the other law enforcement agencies here within the state and here within Newcastle County. Um, if you don't know, but mostly our uh, jurisdiction are your neighborhoods and communities. And so when there is police activity in your neighborhood, we do take into account the time of day that an activity or an event is occurring. So we take, for instance, um, anytime that there are any of these types of examples, a barricaded subject with weapons, a uh, barricaded subject that might be experiencing um, a, a mental illness or a crisis. Uh, we take all that into consideration. 
And so when it comes time for us to make those notifications to uh, the neighborhood, we're also adding that to our checklist of notifying the schools if there's a school nearby. Um, if, it's, if it's in the morning and we know that uh, buses are coming through the neighborhood, we will try our best, we will do our best to make sure that we notify the transportation companies or the school district to inform them that there may, that there may be a delay. Um, if we're searching for wanted subjects, um, the same thing that Sergeant Sturges said is that we're going to, we, as in the Division of Police for Newcastle County, we're going to put that messaging out. We do focus a lot on social media because that's instant and that's quick and that's fast. And our messaging will be the same and we make sure that we um, make contact with the school officials, the school district, which with whatever school district that we may be dealing with. Road closures are a little different. We don't have that many in our jurisdiction, so we rely on the state police as well as uh, Delaware Department of Transportation to make those notifications. But again, just to reiterate, is that in the event that there is an incident or an event that is occurring in your neighborhood and we have to make those notifications, we make those notifications in a number of different ways. And that's through traditional media, through social media, and that's Facebook and Twitter, usually, um, to make sure that we hit both demographics. And then also we make sure that we make contact with the school districts to get that same information out. Thank you. Next person I want to introduce is uh, Frank Burton. Uh, he's retired, 30-year uh, FBI, and he is going to speak about uh, a few things, especially through the eyes and the lens of a young community member. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing? Everybody just kind of sitting here. I like to talk to people. Everybody just sitting there watching. So I'm, I'm going to be speaking to you from a parent standpoint. Uh, JB said I actually did 22 and a half years in the FBI. I have 32 years in law enforcement. Uh, but as we talk about Colonial School District, and that's starting from elementary all the way to high school, when we talk about the power of we, it really starts with us when we talk about gun safety and violence in school. So one of the things that I would say to you all is, you gotta show up for your children. That's where it starts at. You gotta show up for your children. Uh, my kids were, all except for one of my kids graduated from Colonial School District. Uh, the rest of the three children that went to Colonial School District actually were born after I was in law enforcement. And being in the FBI, I traveled all over the country. But I always showed up. PTA meetings, sporting events, uh, assemblies, conferences, parent-teacher conferences, yeah, show up. And find out what's going on with your children. Because what happens scientifically, students whose parents are involved do better academically and athletically in school. So there's a big science behind that. Make sure that you show up for your children. One of the things uh, for our children, too, is I, I was that guy, I was just telling Carl, Carl and I have known each other forever, um, is that with our children, I was that guy, whenever they went on field trips, whenever they went in uh, certain places, uh, the kids would say, is your dad coming on the field trip today? Mm -hmm. And I would make time to make sure that they're there. Here's one thing that I want to share with you guys, if you want a formula for something, uh, as far as gun violence and what we can do better, as a community, it's called the SMART model, SMART. Let's be smart, and the SMART model is simply this. S is secure all your firearms in your homes and in your cars. Don't just throw your, you got a gun, don't just throw it in a drawer, or throw it in the cabinet where your kids have access. And even if you put it up, children are curious, right? If they know it's a gun in the house and, and all this stuff that they see on television and you glamorize it, and they're going to look for it. So be smart. Secure your firearms. The next one is model responsible behavior. And that's what I'm talking about. So with my kids for 
32 years, 22 and a half years that I was in the FBI, they knew that I wasn't building a house. But I didn't glamorize, I didn't go handling it around, and I didn't go playing it with it around them. I had it in a lockbox, I put it up, and I know kids are curious, so I hid mine. And, and I knew I, I, I would sabotage it, so if they went in there, I would know they were in there. So again, be smart with what you do. Uh, a is this, and this is very important. And, and your kids, I don't know, I'm, Stam, I'm old school. And I work with Stam as well. I'm old school. We can't be our children's friend all the time. And I'm, I'm just saying from my standpoint. And thank you. This thing is, listen, before your kids, and I'm talking about early, elementary, before your kids go in your neighborhood to another child's house, ask about if there's a presence of firearms in that home. Go to a, go to a neighbor. I'm telling you, my kids were ticked off at me, and they'll tell you, coming through this high school, and I see a lot of teachers here who had them, they were not allowed to go in their neighbor's houses unless I met them. Because in law enforcement, what I saw was you get a group of kids running around, hanging around, just hanging out, and all of a sudden they get curious and they, they loft it around in the closet and they see a rifle. And all of a sudden they start playing with a rifle. And I'm talking 20 years ago. This happened yesterday in Philly. Guy just shot his kid in the chest playing around with a, with a handgun. So again, make sure that you ask about this. Stop being so scared to ask your kids about what they're doing. They're your kids. Ask them about these things. Uh, I told you I like to have fun with everybody, so watch this. I'm going to say something, and I want you to respond. This is old school, so some of you young cats are not going to know this. <laughs> Ready? Respond. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh. See how y'all said that? <laughs> so, so plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. That comes from speedy bubbles, Alka-Seltzer, right? So you take them two little pills when you ate too much, and you shouldn't eat. And you drink that, so it's, I'm 60 years old, and I still am saying that. That came out in 1951, we came up through the 60s, I still remember that. Younger people, if you catch on fire, what do you do? What are the three things you do? Stop, drop, and roll. Stop, drop, and roll. You guys can talk about that. Well, when I left the Bureau probably around in 2013, probably starting around in, in, in 2010, we had this cartoon because there was an outbreak of school shootings and violence, and especially guns. And one of the things that the FBI has, go look online, it's a guy called Eddie Eagle. And Eddie Eagle is this eagle flying around the city and he's like got these eagle eyes. So he can see when kids are about ready to be in danger. So he spots these kids playing in the house unsupervised. They see a shotgun, they pull it out. All of a sudden, Eddie Eagle flies through the window. And he says four things. He says, stop. Don't touch, leave the area, tell an adult. And he's like dancing in the door. I ain't going to dance. I'm not doing all that. I'm not even singing. <laughs> but the thing is, if we know plop, plop, fizz, fizz, how come our kids don't know that? If you teach them at, at, at that at an early age, if you monitor where they go, then guess what? As they get older in middle school and high school, they'll realize that they just can't go anywhere and do anything. And even if your kids, when they get to high school, Go somewhere. Here's the other thing you got to be aware of. You don't know who's going to be at that, that parent's house. You don't know what their cousins are into. So you got to make sure that you monitor that. The, la the R is recognize the role of firearms in suicide. There's a huge percentage-wise, and I won't go into all that, but it's associated with suicide. And the last one is what, I'm, what we're doing right now. Tell it. Tell it. Tell it. I know all this stuff. Kids talking about snitches get snitches. Well, our kids are dying. Every single day, every single day our kids are dying, and guess what, we gotta make sure that they're aware. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said this, he said an ounce of protection, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So we gotta make sure that we get on top of that. The last thing that I'll leave you with this, as far as a, um, a parent is concerned, in India said it, uh, for the Bureau I was, a, I was a hostage negotiator, I was on special operations, but I was also the PIO. I actually worked with Lauren when she was with Channel 6 uh, with the FBI. One of the things, guys, monitor. She said it. Monitor your kids' social media accounts. Stop talking about, oh, no, they want to be autonomous. Listen, I pay for your phone bill. <laughs> I'm serious. I pay for your phone bill, and if you won't let me see what's on there, you don't get a phone. <laughs> well, you know, if they don't have a phone, then we're not. What did, what did we do before they were phones? 
Call the office and figure out what's going on. These kids, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I love our kids, but man, I'm telling you, you we got to kind of like bear down on that. Again, if you own a weapon, lock it up. Don't expect, and I think I uh, heard India say this, somebody said this, don't, Carl said it. Don't expect our SROs, our, our administration to babysit your kids. That's not what they're here for. They're here to get an education. They're here to, 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 to participate in sports or participate in activities and just become a better person so they can go on in life and do well in college. The last thing is this, and I'll leave you with a statistic. When I said this all starts with us, so if you start from kindergarten to the 12th grade, right, and you think about all the time that our kids are at school, somebody said that's a great amount of time. But if I break it down to you percentage-wise, the school is only responsible for 11%, and that whole time, 11% of your kid's life, guess where that rest of the 89% lies with? You. You. And the last thing is this. As a parent, my oldest son did not attend the Colonial School District. He went to uh, Sally's, and, but he ended up at uh, Johnson Wells University. He's doing really well. All of my kids that attended here, my daughter Ariel, she graduated in 2011. She left here, she went to Hofstra University, graduated with a master's and a bachelor's by the time she was 23. Uh, my son Frank III graduated from here, sports. Again, Ariel was in the band, she did a lot of different things. Uh, Frankie was, uh, played football, basketball, and baseball. He was player of the year, two-time All-State offense, defense, did a lot of different things. He got a scholarship to Ball State. University came back home, just graduated from University of Delaware as a captain there on a championship team. And Zachariah, my baby, he was the first person in the Colonial School District to graduate early. And he ended up going to the University of Virginia on a football scholarship. Uh, and he ended up at University of Delaware. So I leave you guys with this as a parent. It all starts with y'all showing up. It all starts with y'all participating. It all starts to listen. The, the, that's Dr. Menzer. Dr. Menzer and I go way back. Dr. Menzer and his whole staff had my cell number, two cell numbers, a beeper number, my, my home phone. So by the time my kids got home, I knew what they did. I knew what they did. So let's do better at that. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Good evening. My name is Lauren Wilson. I'm the Public Information Officer for the Colonial School District. If you have any questions that you would like uh, to ask of our panel, any comments, I ask you to take a minute right now and just jot them down. I will come down this side of the aisle and Gabe Phillips, our strategic marketing officer, will go on the other side. We'll bring you a mic and uh, we, want every, we want to hear from you. We want to have a conversation about what you've heard tonight. Lauren. Uh, good evening, everyone. I thank everyone for being here today. I think a lot of parents have been waiting for something like this, so we can get some answers to some questions. Um, my question is, why are there not constables at every school, and what would it take for that to happen? Um, I, my children's school was not on the list of one of the uh, buildings that is staffed with a constable. It makes me feel a lot better that there would be somebody running towards the situation while my children were running from the situation. And if now all of us have this information that that school's not staffed, um, it's public information. So now people may avoid um, or go to certain schools that are not staffed with a constable. So that's my concern. <coughs> I'll, take, I'll take a shot at that. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I can't really answer that. As far as why there's not a uh, constable at every school, I don't want to steal Dr. Menzer's thunder. I'm sure he'll have some more information that'll, that'll be uh, helpful to that answer to that question. But I can tell you this, I'm 
I'm going to steal some of your thunder there, Dr. Lindsay. We're going to hire another SRO, and that'll free up the constable position, so we'll be able to have, we'll be able to have a constable to be able to float around. Uh, another reason why there aren't a constable, uh, there isn't a constable at every school is because constables are hard to hire. Uh, most of us are retired police officers, and I can tell you right now, a lot of retired police officers just don't want anything to do with kids. So, <laughs> that's just a plain fact. Um, some districts, uh, I know Appaquinnemick School District has, they have a constable at every, at every school, but not all of their constables have police experience. Uh, that's something, that's something to each individual district, what they, what they consider with, when they hire constables. Do you want to hire a constable straight out of college, or do you want someone who has some type of law enforcement experience? Well. So, <laughs> exactly. I, I will is as part of it, we started in 2018 with one constable who was a former SRO at William Penn, and we knew that this person uh, had law enforcement experience that was valuable to the district, so we capitalized on that, as well as gaining the safety and security teacher. Shortly thereafter that, we hired uh, Carl, and then every year, for the past several, we've been adding to our, our constable team uh, when, the when, again, when we have the candidates who are those that we're looking for, such as, you know, county, municipality officers. I mean, I'm going to call out a few folks there. We have Jamie Rogers, former uh, Newcastle City Police Chief. We have DSP. I know we have county. We have Chester. We're definitely looking for folks who bring the law enforcement experience to the table here in Colonial. And, uh, and to Carl's point, you don't just snap your fingers and make that happen. <coughs> and so we continue to grow, we continue to assess, and as the state provides safety and security money in the various operating and, and budgets that they have, <coughs> it allows us to continue to build the constables. Now, you did steal a little bit of thunder. We are, we are bringing a second SRO into the, into the <coughs> colonial community. They'll be centrally housed uh, at N3 and one here. These are our biggest campuses with our, our most mobile and agile individuals uh, who you know, require significant attention. But then that also is going to free up a constable that's over there to be rotated out into the, mix it, into, the, into the other schools. So it's just thoughtfully doing it, not just to Carl's point, like buying 10 just because there's 10 and the 10 not actually being what we need, where we need them, and when we need them. Yeah, so it's a, it, it's, a, it's, it's a, I don't want it to seem like I'm not answering the question, but I'm trying to, be, it's a, it's the thoughtful building of where we are, just like we've done with our vestibules that you have in at William Penn and in our schools now where you, not only are our schools all locking doors with buzz access, but now you buzz in to get into a secure vestibule that you can't go anywhere but there. And so those are things that we've been growing and phasing into the district over since I want to say 2016, we, we know we went out to the community for a referendum for that and it was voted down. <coughs> the district, it, it's a priority, so we've been continuing to build towards that. We only have a handful of schools left that we're going to be uh, doing those jobs in, and the two biggest ones are Southern and Wilbur. Those are not like under a $500,000, like, hey, it's a weekend reno job. Those are like <laughs> real deal, huge works that, you know, we have JB who does a lot of our, our work also in grant applications that are not just state funding where we get it from the budget. There are also grants out there that uh, JB goes out and after that are for high dollar for infrastructure improvements like the cameras, the halo systems, and, and the secure vestibules. But it, you gotta, you got to phase it in, and sometimes people are like, well, why am I last? Well, you're still safe and secure. We're upgrading as we go, and so it's really about making those thoughtful upgrades, fiscally responsible to the community, because it'd be easy to break the bank and then we'd be coming out to a referendum just to ask to pay the bills, and that's irresponsible. So it's a little bit of a song and dance. I mean, feel like I'm a politician, <laughs> but that is, that is the truth, though. I just want to add another thing. The constable program is relatively new throughout the state, and every school district throughout the state that ever begging for also competing that way. Well, I think I understand. And it, uh, you know, if you're, uh, I think Delaware is probably the only state because I went to a conference back in 2018 in Nevada, and when I told them what I did, and they, uh, a lot of people were surprised that Delaware was that far ahead. And that was 20, 2018. <coughs> so, uh, you know, the Constable program is growing. Uh, it'll probably continue to grow. It's just a matter of, of getting getting the funds to fund that.
Hi, how's it going? My name is Keith Mackey. Um, first, I guess I want to say thank you for expressing that you guys are having training for the teachers, having training for the staff, and going through the extensive training to be on guard for anything that could be of a, a, safety, uh, a safety issue. Uh, just recently, and this past school year, uh, I had my grandson with me, and he experienced a couple of different things. We had scares at the school, and I guess you guys are addressing that as far as the technical, technical issues of social media, where uh, he came to me and said, Papa, I don't want to go to school. And I said that that felt like a, a real concern. And I want to know exactly, I guess, an update on the statistics of what's happening in the district. How many guns were found? How many knives were found? Or what, what you know, where we're at as far as a measurable piece, as far as the, uh, 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 the, the staffing is concerned. We really don't have a statistical number of how many guns were found or percentage of how many guns have been found. I think since, since I've been employed here with this district, uh, the number of real guns that we've confiscated is the one that just happened in January. We've had kids bring in a lot of fake guns, a lot of uh, pocket knives and things like that. But as far as real weapons, uh, we've only confiscated one as far as I, oh no, maybe two. There was one at, wasn't there one at uh, Wally a couple years, a year or two ago? So uh, that's a pretty small percentage as far as we know. Uh, and I'm not gonna lie to you, I can tell you right now, when we had that shooting, I remember I talked to Eric Jones, I said, I don't, I, I know you don't believe this is the only weapon in this school. Because it, it, it probably wasn't. It was the only weapon that was fired that day. And every one of us over here, we know that there's weapons in the school. We just can't protect them. So uh, luckily we're there, we're in the schools, and we're the ones that are gonna confront those people with the weapons when they, when they, they appear. And I like the fact that you have the access program where you can um, you know, detect certain different things. But what was done in reference to those scares? Because at, at Gun and Gunford, we had two scares. So what were those scares? Those so, were scares. So the, the, um, there are several different scares that come out. There's the regular social media one where a kid goes to the mall, they walk to the food court, and an airdrop image gets put onto their phone that says there's going to be, there's a gun pointed, and it has the school's name on it, and it just says next week. And so that kid, everybody walking through the mall, it gets on their phone, the kid opens the airdrop, and they're like, oh. And then the next thing you know, everybody starts talking about it. And then that just turns into like, once the kids go home and show their mom and dad, their mom and dad see it, and then it just spreads like wildfire. Those are the ones that we deal with on a regular basis on Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, mm -hmm. and Sunday afternoon. Those are the like the weekend ones that like happen we take all those scares seriously. And they get investigated, and those students, trust me, w when those phones get confiscated, they get put in tin foil, taken down to the high-tech lab, and those phones, get they go through them, every single one of them, and they trace it all the way back, and they find out the best they can where it started and originated, and if, we're, if the child's in your district, you know about it. So it's investigated. The other one is the robo-threats that were happened several years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was just recently happening where they were, first they were calling them into the schools. A couple years ago it was to the schools. The last couple have been to the agencies in the area, uh, the state police, or I'm sorry, like municipalities, like Newcastle City Police, <coughs> Laurel Police, Seaford Police, like the small municipalities were getting called and said there was an active shooter in a school in their jurisdiction. And so that was, it's happened a couple of times, but the first time it happened here, the law enforcement officers did exactly what they just talked about here. They came up hot and heavy, thinking there was a shooting, and they did all the by the book. It was scary, but there was nothing going on, and it became a time now to communicate and talk and figure out what's going on. They secured the facility. They let the schools know when they could come off the lockdown and resume normal function, and they remained and stayed around and helped talk us through with our families what happened. We had one at Newcastle, uh, that one was at Newcastle School in Newcastle City. So there's a variety of different threats that, that pop up um, throughout. You know, the, the, those are the three biggest ones that I can think of that we get the most. Yeah, and, and another thing to Dr. Menzer's point, when there is an incident, and I know India kind of talked about it too,
from being a, a PIO and then being on special forces, whether it be SWAT or negotiators, I know a parent's inkling when you hear about an incident, you want to show up and don't do that. Because what you do is you contaminate a crime scene and you cause more chaos. The, the PIOs, the school district, they're going to give you the information that you need to have. What happens in this uh, era of social media, it just causes more chaos for law enforcement. So just be cautious about that and, and talk to your kids about that as well and being responsible. So to a couple of the questions that are on, on the sheets here relate to that, Mr. Burton, and I just want to uh, kind of call them out directly. Uh, the one was, why did you lie about the weapon being discharged in school? <coughs> Which is a little bit of what Mr. Burton's talking about. We can only share the information that we have at the time, and I believe I talked about this following the incident on January 10th. Within 10 minutes of us thinking something happened, we told the public we were locking down the school and investigating a situation. It didn't become apparent that there was a weapon discharge until at least a solid hour or hour and 15 minutes following that statement. So to say anything else would be irresponsible because then it feeds the frenzy out there and then we have a situation like we saw on the TV there. Now we own the fact that we miscommunicated internally with our own staff and some of the messaging we used with the community was not the same. And that's something that we own and we've rectified moving forward. We've adopted a new system that was shared, uh, the, the acronym was shared out with the families uh, a, a couple weeks ago. It's a common language across the school, across schools, and across from my office to Mr. Cooper, Dr. Cooper's office, to Ms. Falcon's office, to Holly Sage's office, to the PIO's office. It's the same language. So we're all talking the same language. What happens is in that situation, we didn't all talk the same language to different populations, and that fueled the notion that someone would write a question that we lied. So uh, we own that miscommunication. Dr. Benjamin, real quick, and, and, and to that point, as PIOs and school um, administrators, one of the things that is messing everybody up, we're not Fox News, we're not CNBC, we're not CNN, so we're not trying to rush just to say something, which a lot of them do irresponsibly, like Dr. Menzer said and everybody else said up here, as a PIO, you want to put out the most accurate information, and sometimes it takes time. It might not take, it might not be the time that you want it, but as a PIO, we have a responsibility to report um, accurately. The, the, main, the main problem is social media. You, you would probably get a report from a kid who was at the school on their social media account that there was a shot fired before we can officially say anything. So that's another thing that the PIOs have to deal with. So social media. I do want to add one other point that we did realize from that last situation that we're, we could do better and we're trying to do better. And that's following one of these incidents, no matter whether it's a false threat or a lockdown because there was a disturbance or there was a medical situation and we had to stop a hall change. <coughs> Providing back the community after the fact what happened. That's not something we, prior to uh, the January 10th situation, we were very good at uh, owning sharing back information. While we may have treated it as a blip because it was just a disturbance in the hallway because someone had to be wheeled out in the stretcher, but we stopped the hall, the, the kids were held in their classrooms, there was some angst because not everybody knows what's going on. We, did, we had not been following back up and sharing that information with all those relevant to help alleviate the, st the, tr the stress and the tension. So that goes back to a little bit of the communication gap that we've also learned uh, from in the last situation. Sir, you have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Um, the last uh, school shooting, um, the last lock, last doors didn't stop the shooter. She shot her way through there with a nine millimeter carbine. Um, and most of the, the two schools that I'm familiar with both have glass uh, outer doors. Uh, what's being done to harm the uh, ex exits and entrances coming into the schools? So that's a good question, and uh, it's, it's pretty good time. Uh, right now, as Dr. Menzer said, with the secured entrance ways, we are finalizing the secured entrance way uh, construction for Gunny Beffert, and that's going, hopefully everything goes well, and it will start as soon as the last kid is out of Gunny Beffert this summer. I just received an email because after that incident uh, with that Christian school where they shot through the glass and walked through, you're right, a lot of our old buildings and facilities have that type of tempered glass. Um, I've already reached out to a company about 
a film that actually goes over the existing glass. So we're not replacing all the glass in the district, but for some of those common areas, we can put film on there that is rated to stop and, give, and buy time for first responders to get there. It does not allow bullets to accurately go through a window and it will not allow somebody just to shoot their way through and walk through the glass. So that has already been looked in, into. Um, that is part of the assessment for this year that will get put out uh, and then it start with the cost process of what that's gonna cost to as a district wide, uh, starting with our, some of our schools and getting those done. Uh, but that is a great question, a good concern. Some of the, there are, um, there is regulation, I believe, in uh, construction projects, if they're doing renovations, that certain percentage of the project needs to go to upgrading the, the glass in your office, in your main areas, I believe, that they're installing bulletproof glass. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the exact ratio or the percentage, but in some of the safety security money, it's specifically spelled out. That when you have X amount of work being done, X percent needs to go towards that to upgrade and harden the facility. So it's again, it's an ongoing process. Thank you for the question. Just, just to reiterate, I'm gonna tell you, most school shooters, they don't enter through the front door. They don't enter through uh, uh, fortified entrance. You know how to get into the school? A propped open door, yep. an unlocked door. So you can put all the safety measures you want. You can put them up. If a shooter wants to get into your school, they're gonna get into your school. And statistically, that's how they've gotten in. Secret Service has all kinds of threat assessments and all everything that, that, that measures where school shooters are, who they are, what they do. They don't come through the front door, they don't come through the glass. That particular shooter, she did. She shot the glass and entered that way. Most school shooters enter through open doors, propped open doors that are left open. Before we get to, I just wanna answer a couple more questions on the sheets of paper here. All due respect to those who asked them, I wanna make sure they're gotten to. One of them's related to the secure entrances, uh, and it's something we've been talking about a little bit. Um, there's secure entrance, which is doorbell, buzzer access, which you can't get in. They lock, doors lock. Then there's the vestibule, which is once you're in, you're still not in the building. You can't get into the office, you can't get into the school, you can't get any, any human being. So like that right there when you walk out of William Penn on the right, that glass door there, that's a secure vestibule. You can't get in or out unless you're buzzed into the building, both into the office and out this doorway here. The other, the doorway to the public is wide open. Now, if we wanted to lock down those doors, we could lock them down. Other schools have the buzzer doors not set up like this where they're farther away and there's a doorbell and there's a camera. So, so there's secure door, there's locking doors and then there's secure vestibules. And every entrance is different. You just heard about Gunny Beffords getting done this summer. But if you, someone asks, like, what's the difference? Cary Downey and Wilmington Manor are almost identical schools. Their entrances are gonna be designed the same. But then Newcastle Elementary is a, a high school that was built in 1939. So there's a different design that's gotta go into that. Each school entrance to become a secure vestibule is going to look different and requires a higher degree of uh, engineering and architectural design. So that was, um, the plan is, is we continue to accumulate the, the, the funds to complete the work. The jobs are getting done as we have Gunny Bedford scheduled for this summer, George Reed was last summer. And like I said, Wilbur and Southern are gonna be our, probably our last two because they are gonna require, I think it was the last guess, it was like north of a million dollars each one and that's me being conservative. And we're talking a massive shifting of the operations of those buildings in order to do this. The way it's currently designed doesn't work for where we're headed. And so those are projects that are still, they're down the road, but coming soon. Did you have a question? Um, so my question is just in regards to lockdown drills because fire drills happen once a month. And I understand that lockdown drills do cause stress to some of our students and to some of our staff. But given that it is something that is very prevalent in our society today, um, I'm just curious why it is only twice a year instead of even like four times a year, like once per like semester or marking period, not like every month like fire drills and stuff so like that. So I will say that um, that's a great question and I know that when I was a principal, you wanted to do your safety and security drill. The fire drill was the tried and true for eons because it, it was just something that you did. If we were to ask JB or John Barr here, 
Well, he, he would prefer a safety drill every other day and two fire drills a year, because when's the last time the school burned down, right? Like, so yes, and it is, it's shifting in the dynamic. You'll, my, my guess is that as we move to the NAV 360 with the new language and the new planning, you're going to see more of the safety and security drills. Um, sometimes, you know, we used to do drills when I was the principal that this, sometimes the school didn't even know it was happening. And let me explain why. We'd be standing here in the lobby of William Penn there was a foot of snow on the ground and the roof collapsed on the gym because of the snow. Well, that's gonna send every alarm in the building going crazy. There's no place to go outside. Everyone's gonna be freaking out because the alarms are sounding and nobody knows what's happening in any other of the building. So you, we call everybody, like the custodian, the nurse, to the lobby and say, what are you gonna do? We call transportation yard and say, what are we gonna do with buses that can't even pull in one bus, let alone 80 buses to get kids out of here? The heat's going down, the fire marshal's gonna shut down the building. That's a crisis drill that not a single teacher in the school knew about, but we did it here in the lobby with all the different folks. So sometimes drills happen in different ways. And I'm not making an excuse, but I do think we're seeing more and more of that around school shooting and active, active incidents. All right. Um, Carrie Downey, again, we're working on an officer at that site or something at that site. We do count on the fact that we have a, an SRO or a, we have a constable right down the street. We have a whole team of security folks here. If there were something needed, we know Carrie Downey is right nearby. I'm not saying that they're gonna be last, but like they have, we have adequate ability to get there quickly uh, if needed. Um, substitutes getting keys ability to lock classrooms you know no offense but you know how many times have you lost your keys and if you're a teacher how many times have you misplaced your keys We are, we, we've talked to, I know uh, Principal Lamia has talked to uh, Mr. Uh, Lambert about like how we can you know, provide key access to these doors or why they're not locked automatically behind, like should be pulled <coughs> shut and locked and you know, the, the door's locked. The substitute's locked in essentially and they can't, they shouldn't be able to unlock that door and leave it unlocked all day long. A little bit of that is what JB was talking, Mr. Barr was talking about with the key card access. I mean, they're, they're as we continue to evolve, those key cards can get you in and out of classrooms as people move forward. I know they've been experimenting with various locks at Dunning Bedford that are not necessary. You can lock them from the inside and you don't need a key. And that there is a, but, and they're working on that at Dunning Bedford. So there is a, a, a plan in place to try to make sure that not just substitutes, because I would argue that while we have a lot of substitutes, we have a lot of people who go from building to building right, like therapists, counselors, and you know, they roll up into George Reed, but they also are carried down in Newcastle and William Penn, and which key, like, I'm doing treatment in X hallway, I don't have a key to this door to get myself and my student into this door during a lockdown, what do I do? So it's not, it's not just substitutes, it's bigger than just that. But it's something that we're work, trying to work through. Again, we don't have a, a snap answer, I think. Um, the, the one question that's on here is, uh, you know, why don't we have metal detectors in all our schools? It's something we're exploring and looking at, but it, you can't just snap your finger and put in a metal detector without having other implications, such as who's gonna man it? Which teacher's gonna get that duty? I don't think so, right? Which administrator's gonna get that duty? Which uh, one of these folks here, if you're thinking, well, they can do it, well, who's watching the house while they're watching the metal detectors? Who's doing the things we want them to do while they're watching the metal detectors? Where are we gonna put the metal detectors? In William Penn alone, there's almost 89 doors. Who's watching the other 50, 60, 70 doors while only 10 are open to make sure that somebody doesn't come in because if they wanna get in, they get in. Who's gonna man that? How are we gonna coordinate and track it? Like, what's the system? Is a metal detector the right answer or don't we have technology now that actually recognizes if you have a weapon on you, it just identifies a weapon. It's not just a metal detector, because if we had a metal detector, we'd be going like to the court, we'd be unloading <coughs> countless hours. In fact, there's, there's freestanding ones. So it's exploring which option works best for each site and then trying to get one that we know we can utilize effectively. 
and, and economically and staff it and actually say that we have it, not just buy it, put it up, show it, and say we have it, and it doesn't really actually do the job. And you know, JB and Carl are constantly looking and going and seeing models and uh, activity uh, demonstrations. One step further, I know that JB's looked at things that are their spatial recognition software now for these cameras. That if we, every student's ID is in the system, they see it, it's on the cameras, and it can recognize their faces. Like so, all right. Well, that's pretty interesting. Like, how do you how do you manage that? Who tracks that? Someone asked, does somebody watch our cameras live 24/7? No, our cameras aren't. Paid. We don't pay for monitoring 24/7. We would be going to referendum tomorrow. It, there's we, we have it's saved, it's recorded. We have access inside the building to look at it. Our administrators can pull up any camera. Like right now, like most of our administrators here, if they have cameras in the building, they probably pull up their phone, look on an app, and see what's going on in their building. So there's, we have to be thoughtful and careful about how we move forward with various things, like giving out keys to substitutes. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them, but there's got to be a process for that. Because you know, here at William Penn, there's probably 30 substitutes every day. So let's give, we have to think about, think through that. Who's gonna be responsible for just the substitute keys? I know I was responsible for just the staff keys on any one day when I was the principal here. So it's thinking through that and making sure that it's the best decision for the entire organization. It doesn't distract from their main function like, oh, well, we have constables, they can monitor the, the, the weapons systems. They can guard all the doors. Who, who's watching the, the kids? Who's watching the perimeter? Who's watching the parking lot when they're doing that for that amount of time? So again, I'm just trying to answer the questions that are on here about the substitutes and the metal detectors and um, limiting social media access. I don't necessarily know. I know nobody in the state can use TikTok on any device or any state system. Um, I know our Chromebooks can be set to restrict certain things uh, like YouTube or Facebook or whatever, but normally that's, there's times when families have said, I don't want my child to have access to anything but X, Y, and Z, and our tech people can Skype in there or Zoom in there and shut it down. But then when that child needs to do something that's related to a class that's in that platform, they can't get at it. So there is there are ways to restrict access on our devices, not on any of their devices. And, and but you chime in. Like Mr. Vaughn said about getting someone in the building, if a kid wants to post something on social media, they're going to do it. They're going to find a way. They are tech savvy. So a lot of times it's us in this room keeping an eye or having conversations with their kid. They're going to find a way to do it, and they're going to do it faster than we can ever keep up. That's where, to Mr. Burton's point, we need your help to monitor, to help let us know what's going on because they are some crafty, crafty people, and they make some really, really cool stuff on social media but it can be a little scary at times. That's where we need your help. That's high praise from our craftiest crafty guy on social media, right? <laughs> Gabe's our, he's our strategic marketing officer, but he also manages our social media accounts. And he's the one who sends me the text in the middle of the night that he saw something and we need to deal with it. Or he's the one who's texting the principal. Or then there's Dr. Cooper and Ms. Woodall over there. Just give a wave. They're the ones who get to stop. They're the ones who get the Go Guardian alert at midnight because the kid decides to get on his Chrome and Google, you know, what would happen if I shot myself in the head? He's the one who gets that. He's the one who calls that principal in the middle of the night so that they can reach out to that family immediately to find out what's going on. So we have ability to help and support and do things for in the best interest of all. It's just sometimes you, people don't hear about those things, but they do happen. And it, actually, it's scary. It happens more than you would like Thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Ron Hunley. I'm actually a paraeducator here um, at William Penn. Before I go any further, I want to say, Mr. Barr, thank you for the work that you're doing. The reason why I'm saying that is because I own a firearms training company. And once I came here, I saw a whole lot of issues that was already here. I didn't say anything, but I saw them. Unfortunately, January 10th kind of brought some things to light. So I've been in conversation with 
several other people, and I've seen some things that actually happen. Um, one thing parents need to understand, and I went through this with that individual incident that happened, is that kids was on their phone way quicker than anybody else knew what was going on. And I want to say that for you to really understand that their level of communication is way different than ours. We have to catch up to them. And I've spoken to several people and expressed my individual concerns. So I'm not going to go any further with that. Um, the other thing, when we were talking about as far as the communications here with the kids, please stop them from playing this game called Crunker in these first shooter games. They're doing that in the IT classes. This is what they're doing. Versus them doing their individual work, they're on that individual game. How do I know? Because I'm a paraeducator and I'm in an IT class with kids that don't want to be in that class and this is what they're all going towards. So if we want to stop something that we can do on our side, let's stop that individual access to that. If they're not on code, it doesn't work. Let's stop it from here. Because this is the level of communication and stuff that's actually happening, and we are being reactive. We're not being proactive. And I've mentioned several things as far as me going through the Alice training, as far as what I saw, and I mentioned some things. You know what I mean? And when I see something, I say something. The bottom line is, the people that's here, we hear things that's going on. But if we're not paying attention to it, it just feel like it just sounds like white noise. That's what it sounds like. <clears throat> and for those that's of us that's in the school, if we pay attention to that type of stuff and just put something out, hey, this is what I heard, blah, blah, blah. Somebody else may have heard something else. And they can kind of put this situation together. Because I personally went through it. And I came back like, hey, <coughs> this is what I heard. This is not looking. Something's just wrong here. So the bottom line is that we can do our part. You know what I mean? And as far as what the uh, gentleman was saying, yo, it starts at home. You know, I have no power here. I'm a paraeducator. They don't respect me at all. I'm here to help. You know what I mean? I shouldn't have to be dealing with behaviors and other type of stuff that I'm, all, that I'm already, already experiencing within the classroom in order for me to try to help you get through what you gotta get through. Um, and the other thing is, is that, you know, I'm here to help. And since that particular aspect, I did personally join the security team just to be here, to be another, another set of eyes and ears. So if I hear something, I'll say something. I'll give it to somebody else. It's not for me to figure it, but guess what? I train people outside here. This is here. This is my other job. This is what I do. I'm certified by the state. So the bottom line is, guess what? It got to start somewhere because if we don't start here, we got to face it out in the street. And I'm not going to go. We have, we have a follow up question here. I'm not going to go any further. I'm going to leave it right there. I'm sorry. Thank, thank you for that. We do have a follow up question back here. Thank you. I don't want to talk to the school resource officers. And I do appreciate that you are trying to ramp up and employ school resource officers in those that don't have. But my question is, my kids go to Wilbur Elementary, and a lot of the shootings have been in elementary schools. What is the response time, should something happen at Wilbur, to have a school resource officer at that school? Because I'm a very good directional challenge, but Wilbur seems pretty far away from the closest school resource officer. The closest, the closest constable to Wilbur is me at Gunning Bedford. And I can be there within two, three minutes. And just to give you an example, uh, two years ago, we had an incident where a girl uh, called 911. They called a SWATI incident. So when they called, when she called 911 and reported that three people had been shot at Gunning Bedford, and there's an active shooter within the school, the 911 center knows that I'm there. They call me, says everything good there. I said, yeah, everything is good. It's, it's a student. We knew it. It's a student. Uh, you don't have to send, you can just send one unit. Before I hung up the phone, there was at least 40 troopers outside long guns. So the response time is pretty quick. I'm not that far from, from Wilbur at all. I have another question, uh, a couple questions.
question. Are the teachers trained in firearms and have and have them or have the option to have one? No. <laughs> It's been, we've been developing how that looks. It's been, typically it's been left up to the building to do when the building could do it. And I think we're trying to do a little bit more of a thoughtful collective at the beginning of the year, but not everybody's hired at the beginning of the year. So like it's the beginning of the year, we get that group. It's the person who was hired September 2nd that we have to capture, plus everybody was hired all the month of September, all the month of October. So when it says new hire, generally speaking, we're talking about our summer hires and our spring hires, and then we get to working through now, J JB's been working through trying to figure out, all right, what's a systematic way to catch the December hires so that we can also get them on board sooner than later? So that is, a, that is a, when it says that, it could be, it seems potentially deceiving, but it's new hires, and we do it definitely with our new hires, the giant group, but we're working through how we're gonna catch up people who were missed. And there's some folks in this district that have probably had Alice training probably going on three times now um, because our buildings will reach out, our principals reach out, and they just want a refresher for their building. One, to utilize it as a refresher, go through the training, capture new hires, and then also work it as a drill too as well. Um, well I know like our nutrition services just had one at William Penn here during one of the last PD days, and I know a few folks jumped in who were not nutrition workers just to get part of the training. So we are trying to figure out a way to capture more of those folks who are new hires, because in this day and age, new hires taking on a new meaning. And if you, if you haven't had Alice yet, the best thing for you to remember is to lock your door. Lock your door. That's the most important thing. If you take anything out of Alice, that's the most important thing to take is to lock your door. I got two more questions. Um, how young are the children who are being told or trained what to do in things like access control and things like that? How, how young are they? Speak about Alice. Um, we can we train elementary all the way up to high school. The verbiage for elementary kids is certainly different for what is being taught to the middle school and high school kids. And we tell our staff, you know, go through the plans with your elementary kids, let them know exactly what, why, how we're going to go through this lockdown drill or whatever emergency plan it is, because that is the anxiety some of the kids face, and, and also some of the middle school and high schoolers face. So we work through the, with the staff during training or if they want to reach out before the drill, that's part of the tabletop part. Then I work with the principals and say, okay, put this language out for your teachers to share with your students before the drill. And that helps with the anxiety. It helps with the kids to also be prepared to make the, the drill worth it, go through the process, and then also have that after action with, with those kids. Last question is, and this is for the officers and probably myself, uh, like the Amber Alert, can we as parents get alerted when something happens in school in the neighborhood? Or I know you guys touched on that. Do you want to touch on it? Any, or I can speak to it for the school district. So the, is, the question is when something occurs in the neighborhood? Um, when something happens like an Amber Alert, it's, can they be can they be alerted? Such as like an Amber Alert, can can the parents be alerted? Like, uh, have you speak on behalf of your agency? Right. So when when we send out a message, um, and again, it's going to depend on the type of situation, but you're going to get those 911 or those reverse calls that a lot of us ignore because we think that they're spam. But we just recently had an incident with a missing 11-year-old, and we did a reverse 911, or we did those telephone calls, um, those robo calls, and some people ignore them. But it's going to go out, it's definitely going to go out on social media, and that's going to be the quickest, fastest way for us to notify individuals. But most people have that Amber Alert. For, for example, if it is one of those incidents, such as an Amber Alert, it's going to come to your phone automatically, and that's outside of us. In terms of the school district, the, I, stuff like this is the best way I can tell you is to make sure the contact information we have for you for your, is on file and is correct. 
because that information is crucial. We do our best, and trust me, because I'm the one that's doing it, and I'm often contacting my wife because I'm talking about my own children that go to Blood Mill. Getting the information out as fast as we can, as we discussed tonight, but that information that we have on file has to be correct. That is so crucial. So I encourage you to follow up with your school secretary, look on our website to sign up for alerts, do whatever you can to make sure the information we have for you, not only to get in touch with you if something happens with your child during the day, but that we can get in touch with you if something like this happens, or if there's really great things happening in our school. I know how much you all love hearing from your principal on a Sunday night, especially during football season. It's really great, but it's crucial that we have that correct information. Also, this is why it's important that you're following the correct platform, because a, a lot of, uh, I can speak in terms of Delaware State Police and Newcastle County Police Department, we put a lot of our information out um, through, through via the news releases. It, so if you're signed up for our blog, blogs on our news releases, as soon as we click publish, you're immediately getting it in your email. So that's why it's important to follow those things. It's also important to follow us on Twitter. Both agencies have Twitter uh, uh, Twitter accounts. Follow us on that. We post our news releases on those accounts. We post our news releases on uh, Facebook as well. So make sure that you're signed up for the right account so that way we can get the information to you. Because of time, we're going to wrap things up. Uh, Mr. Barr, uh, Mr. Bond, uh, and, and, and Dr. Menzer will be here. Uh, for those of you who have questions, who still have questions, I, I know, ma'am, you had a question over here. They'll be able to address your questions personally. We want to thank everyone for coming out. This is not going to be the last um, Safety and Security Summit. We hope to have this every year because it is that important that you stay updated. We want to thank uh, you for coming out. Um, and, and before we go, I want one point that, that um, we should make is that when parents rush to the school, they slow up the response time for first responders like you. If you could just address that for a minute. Yes, uh, my name is David Maestro, I'm the fire chief at Google Fire Company. Um, so that's absolutely correct. You know, when, when there's an incident at the school, uh, the most important thing to do is that we're gonna need access. The police department prioritized over the fire department and EMS. Uh, but, but we're going to need to have clear, direct access to the school. Uh, so what's not going to be helpful is, you know, there's uh, quite a number of students here uh, that attend the school. If every parent comes to pick up their student, uh, there's not enough room on Basin Road uh, in its entire length to fill that with cars. Uh, so it, it's going to be detrimental to trying to stop the incident and then provide care. Uh, so we're going to ask, obviously, that you know we're going to get police agencies involved, DelDOT. Uh, even fire police and fire department, but we need you to not crowd the school when that happens. Thank you for that. Well, and, and if I could, um, really quick, if I could just say something right here. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> so if I could just say something really quickly. You, you heard it from uh, Mr. Burton when he said, if you see something, say something. And, don't, and snitches, snitches get stitches, right? So one of my mentors says that silence breeds violence. Mm -hmm. So we are asking you to say something. You all are, the statistics already just said, you all are with your children 80 some percent of the time. So you know their behaviors, you know if something's not right. So call, who, call an administrator, call one of the counselors or the therapist, call someone. Because again, as we've said, if you don't say anything, then something may happen. Again, thank you so much for coming out. If you do have some questions, some comments, uh, they're up here, uh, they're gonna stick around for a few minutes. We just, uh, again, say this won't be the last, and we are, uh, appreciate all of you for taking your time for coming out. I do wanna say one thing before we do leave. I do wanna thank Lauren and Gabe for putting this together in our communications department. <laughs> definitely especially want to thank our, our, our <coughs> colleagues, our friends in the Delaware State Police and the Newcastle County Police for being here. We want to thank Mr. 
the illustrious superstar, Mr. Frank Burke, <laughs> for coming out and spending some time with us. It's good to catch back up with Frank and our, our, two, uh, our two staff, uh, JB and, and Carl, who are instrumental in safety and security here in Columbus. I want to thank them and definitely thank you for coming out. And this will be an ongoing conversation. Sometimes we may not have the answer. Some people might not like the answer. Some people might not lo understand the direction we're going. But we are moving forward. We are making progress. And it is about having these open, honest dialogues and being vulnerable and reflect on what we can do better next time. So thank you very much.